Good afternoon, members of the media, wider viewing and listening public of Trinidad and Tobago. Welcome to this week's very brief media post-cabinet media conference. Thank you all for coming here at such short notice. The main item that I've come here to announce today, and there will be a follow-up in the next couple of weeks providing more details, is in fact an excellent piece of news for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. You all would recall that in March of last year, the government had announced at an energy spotlight certain things that had taken place in the past and certain positions with respect to our gas molecules. And we felt that there was time for us as a country to re-enter into discussions with some of the large multinationals. In April of this year, the Honorable Prime Minister led a delegation, including the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, Minister Franklin Kahn, and myself, when the Prime Minister was heading to the Chogum Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London. He led that small delegation to meetings with the heads of BP and Shell in London. Coming out of those meetings and discussions with BP and Shell in London in April of this year, all three parties announced that one of the agreements was that they would each appoint empowered negotiating teams to sit and negotiate terms and conditions of contracts going forward into the future and how we would deal with certain other items that we had raised on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. As we have mentioned over time, those teams have been meeting Cabinet appointed Minister Khan and myself to lead the negotiations on behalf of the government of Trinidad and Tobago and actually the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And we were ably supported at the next tier by Mr. Wendell Motley and Mr. Leroy Myers and a host of other persons, including the international law firm of White and Case, Putin and Partners. I am happy to say that after months of very intense but progressive negotiations and discussions. Just yesterday, and actually the day before, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has reached agreement with BP and also with Shell. One of the main items that the country may not be aware of is the existence of Train 1, an Atlantic LNG, going beyond April 2019. So the contractual arrangements and also the life of Atlantic LNG Train 1 comes to an end in April next year. So one of the conversations that had to take place was, was there going to be a future for Train 1 of Atlantic LNG going forward beyond April 2019? The government of Trinidad and Tobago and this empowered negotiation team has been in very intense discussions and negotiations with both BP and Shell over the past few months. And only yesterday, we reached an agreement for the continuation, possible continuation of Atlantic Train 1 beyond April 2019 for five more years. But most importantly, for the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we have agreed new pricing formula going forward. We cannot at this stage get into all of the levels of detail that we would like to, but in the next coming weeks, in the next couple weeks, there will be the provision of the details and more details with respect to this. But what we're happy to announce is that the government of Trinidad and Tobago and that empowered negotiation team has been able to reach agreement with both BP and Shell that significantly enhances the revenue for the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the continuation of train one for the next five year period. Included in that, we have been able to secure for the first time as part of the Train 1 arrangement, the ability for Trinidad and Tobago through NGC to sell LNG cargoes on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So that means that that is a major achievement that we did not have before. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the representatives of both BP and Shell for the very mature attitudes that, and demeanors that took place over the past few months. There were some very, very intense moments along the way. There were the holding of certain positions, and we held position on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and had indicated that if we couldn't come to an agreement, we would be, able, we would be prepared to walk away from it all and go and explain that to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. 
This is one of the main items that was agreed this week by both BP and Shell. We have also come to very to major agreements with BP, and they will make their announcements within the next couple of weeks, and then we will join them, and the Prime Minister will address it along with the Minister of Energy in the coming weeks as well. We were able to agree the first phase of negotiations with BP that is going to result in significant further investments in Trinidad and Tobago and the extension of a major license for them. And we will now move into the second phase of negotiations with BP as, as our empowered negotiation team. And from next week, we will begin to engage Shell now in the substantive negotiations of further terms and conditions to do with their operations in Trinidad and Tobago. So the announcement for today is we have augured well over the past few months. We have achieved what many naysayers said we would not be, a, be able to achieve. Unfortunately, there were a lot of commentators who said that the government was going to destroy foreign direct investment in Trinidad and Tobago, and we should not engage the multinationals in the way we have, and that there's sanctity of contract, and that what we're doing is we're destroying our relationships with these multinationals. We have proved once again as an administration that the exact opposite has taken place. And I stand here today to make the preliminary announcement that we have reached agreement with both BP and Shell with new price formulas for LNG train one going forward from April 20, May 2019 going forward for five years, but we've also negotiated successfully with BP in particular, the first phase of their negotiations, which is going to result in significant further investments in Trinidad and Tobago at enhanced revenue for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. I also take the opportunity to thank our advisors, White and Case and Poton, and the other members of the government's empowered negotiation team. As I said, Messrs. Wendell Motley, Leroy Myers, Richard Jeremy. We had local attorney Richard Beckles. We had representatives from NGC led by Mr. Mark Loquan. We also had the White and Case team, the Poton team. We had the PS from the Ministry of Finance, Mr. Vishnu Dan Paul. And uh, then we also took into these negotiations some of the young professionals from the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, because we've demanded that the young people have the opportunity to sit at the negotiation table with us and to learn from these great once in a lifetime experiences. So the people of Trinidad and Tobago, today is indeed a proud day for us as a country, because we've shown that we as a people are very competent and, it, and we are capable of negotiating better enhanced terms with the largest multinationals in the world who are experts in these areas and have their resources. And there was mutual respect at all times at the table. And again, I thank BP and Shell and their representatives for the mature deliberations that took place and for the attitude that prevailed even when we had hit some difficult spots along the way. We will manage to all overcome. In these types of negotiations and discussions, no one a successful negotiation, no one ever walks away with everything they wanted. And I think when further details come out, the people of Trinidad and Tobago can really stand proud in knowing that we have achieved what we are told we would not be able to achieve. And that is in no short part, thank you to the attitude of these multinationals as well and engaging us at the table. And we manage to negotiate much better and enhanced terms, which we will get into in the coming weeks. That was the major announcement that I wanted to make here this afternoon, and I thank you all. At this stage, as usual, I'll entertain a few questions. Um, just a few questions about train one. Um, currently, um, how many people are attached to train one in terms of you know, how many people are employed and such, and how will they be affected by the change over <coughs> in at these negotiations and discussions, you don't get into that level of detail. But as part of it, Minister Khan and I had asked for Atlantic to make a presentation along the way for us to have a better understanding of exactly that question you've asked. I cannot remember the exact number of persons employed in Train 1. But what it means is it's been given five more years of life, so persons will continue to be employed. But the good news is there is a lot of work that now needs to take place once the shareholders agree. There are four shareholders in Train 1 a Chinese company, NGC, both of them have 10% each, and then BP and Shell are the major shareholders. There's a lot of work that is now going to take place to, to get 
train one up to spec. It's the oldest train. And uh, if I remember correctly, there are a few hundred people who will now be employed over the next few months next year going forward to do the necessary type of technical work, engineering work, enhancement work to train one. So it's actually going to be a boost in employment um, whilst that work is taking place. And I expect that they will continue with whoever is employed in train one continuing over into the future. Kind of estimate in terms of how much how much money or much revenue could be generated by, by this. I am not at liberty to disclose that. Um, some because that really is a shareholder issue. But yes, we did discuss with them how much money would be spent in the enhancement and the improvement in technology of Train One, and it is a, a fairly substantial amount of money. Sean. <coughs> I don't want to get into any level of detail with it at this stage. We as a government, and in fact yesterday I was in a meeting with the, the Minister of Finance on it, we as a government have taken very careful note of what some of our CARICOM brother and sister countries are saying with respect to this deal and uh, the complaints that they've made. I've also heard Republic Bank side saying that all of these contracts, all of these transactions are always subject to the approval of regula regulators, which I know from my, my past life. So they're going through that process now. And that is really a Republic Bank question. The government of Trinidad and Tobago is the largest shareholder in Republic Bank. So it is something that we're going to engage in conversation with them directly about and understand what is happening and where it is going, etc. That's your first S. What? I, I saw the press conference yesterday, but I did have a little concern with the environmental. In the, I'm looking at like the nylon pool is a unique feature that there were certain tides that would have created it and deposits it. And uh, if you start sort of poking around there, and then the other thing there was you know, the nylon pool, as you know, is quite a few hundreds of meters out, if not kilometers away from that, that, that spit and that area where the development may take place and is proposed it takes place, there will be no interference with the nylon pool because very little is being affected on the ocean currents. There's been a study done, et cetera. And even the, what we're looking at, the potential of building some over the water rooms, et cetera, as it was explained yesterday by Adam Stewart, Mr. Adam Stewart, there's very little direct contact with the water. You're li literally putting down either wooden or concrete piles, and then everything is built above the water and brought back onto land. So areas like the nylon pool and these things will not be affected. As was indicated by Sandals yesterday, they will be using technology that can actually enhance the rebuilding of reef and, and, and these types of things. And I cannot overemphasize, once again, the environment and the environmental concerns are of concern to the government of Trinidad and Tobago and to Sandals. And we are not looking to do anything that would be detrimental to the environment. We are working with environmental consultants, and we will work with the EME through their process. Then on the um, mangrove, because you did say that there wouldn't be a little bit of um, there is the possibility of, yes, some of the mangrove being interfered with. Yeah. But what happens international standards is if you take up some of the mangrove, what the EME, we expect the EME to then say is you have to transplant more mangrove, and we'll and I indicate the areas and make sure that that happens. Okay. And the last S was scratch bombs. Any updates? Thank you for the opportunity to update on the scratch bombs. As we had indicated, the cabinet had taken a decision that falls to the purview of the Minister of National Security. And in particular, I am utilizing section 37 of the Explosives Act. I'm sure all of you all have looked at that section by now. What it does is it actually empowers the Minister of National Security by legal order to, amongst a number of other things, to either ban the importation and sale 
of the scratch bomb items, I have already started that process at the Ministry of National Security and asked that the necessary order be drafted along with the Attorney General's office. And when that order is completed and drafted and approved by cabinet, we will then take it. I'm not quite sure um, the, the, the process through parliament, but we will take it through that process. And I've asked for that to be done as a matter of priority. I want to complete that process within the next couple of weeks. Part of the that exercise is going to be identifying exactly what explosives is the legal term used will we will ban the importation and sale of and i can see at this stage i intend to propose the cabinet we go as extensively as possible so in trinidad we use the term scratch bombs but since i've said this the number of people who have messaged and written etc to identify the various i've never bought these these items but to identify the various um, items that are available for sale and purchase in Trinidad, we intend to capture as much as, of it as possible. I have observed persons holding the opinion that it is already banned. The answer to that is no, it is not already banned. The sale and importation is not already banned. There's a specific act, the Summary Offenses Act, that makes it a criminal offense to set off explosives in certain areas, etc. I assume that's what they're referring to. They then say as well, well, People will then just engage in illegal activity. But as a lawmaker and as a government, part of our mandate is to improve the laws of Trinidad and to be going to use the laws to protect persons. That's what we will do. I then expect the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to enforce the law. And I have no reason to disbelieve or to doubt that they will, in fact, um, enforce that new, new law once it's passed. Now, you said something that the order has to go through um, is that a long, is that a debate or, I, I thought it was like a ministerial stroke. Well, and that's, that's what I've also asked for. I mean, I looked at the section 37 myself. I've now asked for the CPC department to, to advise on that, etc. As to whether, as you say, it could just be a ministerial order or whether it is a type of order that needs to be made pursuant to legislation. I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, as a citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, and then secondly, as the Minister of National Security, as I've already conveyed, to thank all of the law enforcement officers that were specifically involved in that operation. I was being kept abreast of things as they, as they transpired by the Commissioner of Police. The, the Commissioner of Police has identified the various arms in the police service, the anti-kidnapping squad, I believe the Northeastern Division, um, the Special Operations Response Team and other uh, bodies in the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service who played a direct role in that thankfully successful operation. There are other parts of national security that were involved, and I would just like to thank them for this renewed energy and vigor that we've seen being displayed within the last few months, and I continue to encourage them. As the Minister of National Con Security, I continue to support both the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service and all of the other arms of national security and under the mandate that once we're acting within the param parameters of the law, you have my full support. Is there a concern we're seeing some of these crimes being uh, perpetrated by people who are getting their hands on uh, what seems to be police clothes, uh, camouflage? <coughs> From what I saw, it was a bulletproof vest being worn by the individual with a police sign on it. I have not as yet... I, I, just came out of cabinet. We do have our phones in cabinet. I've not yet received the report as to whether it was official, an official police bulletproof vest. And then as well, well, we know the story with camouflage. Um, camouflage is illegal to be worn. In fact, one of the things I've done as the Minister of National Security since taking up that position is that I've asked for a policy paper to look at this whole ban and use of camouflage. But what we saw yesterday was the camouflage type of material that appears to be like our defense force. It is obviously of, of concern to me as the Minister of National Security as to people utilizing this type of arm. Where and where are they getting it from? Um, there has been a renewed vigor from the TTP in the last few months. I guess that coincides with the appointment of uh, Commissioner Gary Griffith. Anything you'd like to comment on? The Commissioner of Police Gary Griffith has brought a new air and a new energy, but also I'm seeing it because there is a lot more. One of the things I've been trying to drive as a Minister of National Security is ensuring that we have the right people in the room at all times. 
So there are weekly meetings of all of the heads of the national security. So you have the Trinidad Tobago Defense Force, the SSA, even the fire service, the prisons, ODPM, and all of these areas, and making sure everyone's on the same page. You all would have heard, us, heard me speak about getting a fully functional national operations fusion center where all of these bodies will populate it with liaison officers. So there's been, I would say, a, a renewed sense of or rebuilding of relationships between the various bodies. And I, from where I sit, I'm seeing the very positive and progressive effects of that. Your friend Bernie is working right now. I have always avoided, at every stage, talking about having a crime plan. But certain of the things that the pillars and certain of the strategies that I've been trying to drive and listening to those who have the, the expertise, i.e. the chief of defense staff, the commissioner of police, the deputy commissioners of police, the colonels, the, the, the prison officers sit at that table, et cetera, as well. Yes, things are, they are working in a positive man manner and, ma and a way. Of course, crime continues to affect the country and affect our citizens, and it's something that we will continue to push hard against and to continue implementing, especially through the use of technology, new strategies as we move forward. Thank you, Leon. Um, we, there, have, th there have been many reports coming from UNI in particular as it relates to security. It has been said that UNI is a private institution, but given that so many of our nation's young people um, educators and stuff attend that facility daily. Um, is the Ministry of National Security at all in talks with the University of the West Indies to s address some of these critical concerns, especially given the kinds of reports that are coming from the university? The Ministry of National Security is not the preventative arm, as you know. So that's the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service. And I know that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has been engaged in discussions with UWE. Um, I have had conversation with some of the executive personnel at UE just to lend support and to find out I stand ready if there's anything that we can assist with that we pre we're prepared to assist. It is of concern, as I say, everywhere where crime touches is of concern to us as a government. Um, there are certain things I'm sure that they can put into place, but at this stage I leave that for discussions between UE and the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, where we stand ready to assist in whatever way we can. Um, on the FEMA Williams issue, um, the attorneys made a call for the Ministry of Sport to arrange her compensation first before further funding is given to the TT Gymnastic Federation. Was that discussed in cabinet? That has not been discussed as ca at cabinet, and uh, I am not sure how they would have sent that into the Ministry of Sport and Youth, Youth Development, but that question is best posed to the Minister, Minister Cujo. That's it? Okay, thank you all very much. I